Hey, what's going on everybody? It's Jason Frosto for TennisUnleashed.net. And in this video, I'm gonna do a stats and 3D analysis breakdown using Dartfish software of the 2019 French Open semifinal played between Roger Federer and Rafael Nadal. In this part, we're gonna focus on rally lengths and big and small targets. So if you're interested in seeing this exclusive information and breakdown, make sure you stay tuned because it's coming up next. So let's break down the rally lengths first. Typically what you see on the men's tour is that 60 to 70% of the points played are in the one to four shot category. That means the vast majority of points played are really short points, right? Serves, aces, missed returns, maybe a serve plus one, things like that. In this match, things were a lot different. You had really windy conditions, you had cold conditions, and you just generally had really slow conditions. So one to four shot points in the first two sets especially, 44% of the points were one to four shots. So we go from 60 to 70, all the way down to 44. It was much more of a grind fest in the first two sets than you typically see in a men's match. In the third set, when things really started to get away from Federer and he started to slip and Nadal picked up his level, things changed. Then we went back up to our more traditional stats. So it was 69% of the points were one to four shots in the third set. It's also important to remember that your rally lengths and your average rally lengths will be lower when matches aren't as competitive. We're gonna see more one to four shot points when a, a set isn't competitive or a match isn't competitive. And we know that the game is getting more aggressive. It's going in more of that direction, but it's really important to remember that you have to also be consistent at the right time and be willing to rally and play through tough conditions, right? So Nadal was able to do that while still hurting Federer. So now that we talked about that one to four shot category, let's get into some other things. Let's start talking big and small targets and let's jump into the 3D analysis. All right, so let's jump into the first 3D analysis point. We've got a baseline oriented point, Nadal serving on the far side, Federer receiving on the near side. Let's see what happens. The first thing that we see from Roger is we see Roger move back on a diagonal to his left to hit a forehand, right? He wants to play the forehand. He wants to try to set up the first shot by hurting Nadal if he can. So he hits the forehand. He does a pretty good job with the ball, except for the fact that the ball lands short inside zone two, right? So it's a shorter, weak ball. Nadal has time to move around this and set up for his forehand. And he is on his back foot. He backs up a little bit. The contact's a little bit up in the strike zone, it's not above the shoulder where we could really hurt somebody, but it is a little bit higher up. He takes it down the line, but he does hit short here. Federer moves forward diagonally a little bit here to take the backhand, does a good job of closing off his stance and gets an aggressive position. We will see here though that with Federer, the contact's pretty high, right? So he's not really trying to get in a position where he's hitting a lot of really high backhands that are at shoulder height. He wants to be hitting those a little bit lower if he can. So Nadal did a good job of getting the ball up a little bit, right? Forcing him into that. We can see though, Roger handles it really well. Gets some really good depth in the third zone here. So we can see that ball is really deep, which is exactly what we want. And he's got Nadal hitting off of his back foot in a slightly uncomfortable position right here with his body, right? So he's positioned back, his weight is backwards. Nadal struggles with it, aims it to the middle of the court, hits it in zone two, a little bit short. Federer again, and this is one thing that Federer struggled with, getting into targets here a little bit. Federer struggled with getting depth in this match um, off a lot of balls. So here he got some good depth and he hurt Nadal. But it was certain situations where he struggled with getting depth, and we'll get into that in a second. But here again, he hurts Nadal just with pure depth, right? The ball isn't in the corners of the court. It's just really nice and deep with some good pace. Back foot for Nadal, he hits short again. Federer again gets the backhand. And in this position, Federer decides to flatten out the backhand right here. So he flattens it out, he goes cross. And one of the big issues that Federer had with this particular shot is when he flattened it out, he got super aggressive, but look where the ball landed, right? So it lands big target short in zone two. Now the target's fine. It's the fact that he didn't have the depth on the ball, right? So Nadal scrambles over. But the interesting about this and why Rafa was able to get out of this position is he was originally back here and Federer hits short and aggressive. So Nadal actually takes a diagonal forward to the ball to receive this defensive ball. If he was in a really bad defensive position, not only would he have to move out to his left, but he'd have to move back while moving out to his left. He didn't have to do that because Federer didn't get his depth on his shot, right? So 
One thing we can do here with dartfish is we can go into a measurement mode. When Nadal's forehand here crosses the net, his shot is 12 feet off of the ground. So he's got a ton of net clearance here. That might have been a good opportunity for Roger to sneak into the net if Roger hadn't hit his shot short. Had he hit it deeper and Rafa pops this up, he could probably easily sneak in and finish off the point. So he's trying to go from this defensive position here and get some depth on this shot, right? To neutralize the situation. Federer steps around not thinking that Nadal's gonna hit the ball so deep, but look where Nadal's ball lands lands back here in zone three, closer to the baseline, takes a little bit of a weird bounce, and Federer misjudges that, and all of a sudden, Roger goes into a position where he's reaching for the ball, and he's off balance right here. So he's fully extended, and he's completely off balance in a really poor position, right? Federer goes small target from a really bad balance position. Now, this is not something an average person should definitely try. This is something Roger shouldn't have tried in this situation either. We can see all the targets here were actually big targets until he tried to hit this shot. But he goes small target from a really tough position. The court here now too is also completely wide open for Nadal if he wants it. We'll see what happens. He sets up comfortably for the backhand, right? Crosses his stance over, good balance. He doesn't really do anything with this. Sort of plays a neutral, high heavy backhand. And the reason we know it's kind of a high heavy backhand is where Federer is receiving it from. So we can see Federer taking this ball closer to his shoulder height. So Rafa got the ball up a little bit. And that's what Nadal was trying to do, right? Trying to get the ball up to make it a little uncomfortable up in the, the top part of the strike zone. Federer hits cross. It does a good job of hitting deep here. It's a good deep target. And every time pretty much that Federer hit deep like this, he would get Nadal in a position where Rafa would back up and Nadal would concede ground, and he'd get him on his back foot like this consistently. The problem was Federer not getting depth when he was really attacking, okay? So he goes cross again, and what Nadal does here, which is pretty interesting, on the back foot, but he goes a little bit wide, right? It's not a small target, but it's enough where if you look at Federer's position here, Federer's having to move to this ball a little bit more than he had to move to some of the other balls. And Federer decides he's gonna go for broke and he goes small target cross court and then he ends up missing that shot, right? So a couple of interesting decisions by Federer. So the first one being, and obviously it's unintentional, but he took that first aggressive backhand that's coming up right here. Took the first aggressive backhand and did a good job except for the fact that the ball was short. If he hits that deep, Nadal floats it up, he could probably sneak in and finish off a volley, but that didn't happen. Then he ends up going for a small target from a really poor balance position there. Um, plays a good deep forehand here. Nadal does a good job with it. Federer has to move a little bit more here. Is a little bit uncomfortable. My observation and opinion, when he had to move to this ball, he was a little uncomfortable moving to it. And then he decided to go for a small target on top of that. And then he ends up losing the point. So if we look at the stats from the 3D analysis of this match, we see some really interesting things. Through the first two sets, Federer hit 78% of his first four shots, that's the, uh, the return of serve, the serve plus one, and the return plus one, and also the final shot, the finishing shot. He hit 78% of those shots in the big target area. That's all the green targets that we see here. And he hit 22% of his shots then, you know, in the small target area. For Nadal in the first two sets, he hit 84% of his first four shots and his final shot in the big target area. Now. We know from the research data that we've done, you know, it's exclusively on tennisunleashed.net, where we're not just covering the first four shots and the last shot, we're actually covering all the shots. We know from that data that the smaller targets are gonna be more likely to come in the first four shots and the final shot when we're more likely to be aggressive in a point because we have easier balls to work with. Let's go into the second big target 3D analysis point now. And we have Nadal serving on the near side, right? So let's see how this point unfolds a little bit. Serves backhand, jams Roger up just a little bit with that. Just a little uncomfortable for Federer. He's a little jammed in this position here. If we kind of zoom in, we can see that. The contact is too close to the body. And it's not Roger's fault. It's a good serve that kind of hooked into him. But Rafa jams him there and forces a weak return. Now, Federer does a good job here. Even though he hit really short here, look at Nadal's contact height. He's forcing Nadal into a high contact point. So even though the return was short, he gets it up. So that means there was good net clearance. Nadal backs up. Goes right back into that Federer backhand. And his goal here, right, is to hit 
balls that do damage and balls that get up on Roger when he has the opportunity from certain positions. So Federer went up on Nadal, and then Nadal comes back by going up higher on Federer, making him take the backhand close to the shoulder, which is tough to drive, right? Let's see what Federer does. I really like Roger's choice here. He loops it up high above the net, good net clearance. Gets pretty good depth for the most part, could be a little bit deeper, but look what he forced Rafa into. And we talked about this. When Federer got pretty good depth and height, he would force Nadal back. And when you're forcing Nadal back, it's gonna be tough for him to be really aggressive because his body weight's back and the ball's up. So that was a really good shot by Roger to give it a little more height, hit it more heavy, and get it up on him. Um, Nadal ends up hitting short, and then Federer takes the opportunity here. Now he steps around. Semi-open stance from this position. Judging by his hips, it looks like he's 100% going to take this ball inside out somewhere in this area. Let's see what he does. He does. And when I say judging by his hips, what I mean is as a person rotates their hips here, as their legs uncoil to hit the forehand, the legs will give away and the hips will give away the shot direction. Now in real time, obviously it's really difficult to see, but as we go frame by frame, you can actually see that the way the hips rotate, that's where that forehand's going. So he hits it over there, doesn't get enough depth on it, right? Nadal does a good job though. He recognizes the threat. He's back in the court waiting to receive. He gets another pretty high ball here above the shoulder. Takes it back cross and hits short but he's trying to get it up. Federer intercepts it, takes it super early. And one interesting thing from this position is, this applies to a lot of different people. If you're this far outside of the court where Roger is right now, typically you're gonna have to finish the point here or finish it here. You can see Nadal shading this side of the court, so it's really unlikely he's gonna hit a winner over here right now. But if you're taking yourself this far off the court, you better do something with it, otherwise you're potentially in trouble on the next ball, okay? Really good depth from Federer here, great shot. Super deep, still a big target, just inside the small target area. Nadal is still back because he has to be you know, further behind the baseline to try to receive this properly. He hooks it cross. And this is where Nadal's anticipation skills come into play. So he hooks the ball cross, back cross court. It lands super short because of Federer's aggressive depth on that ball, right? He got, he got what we're looking for. Pace plus depth together means short ball. Now the mistake that he makes though is he goes immediately into this slice right here. So we can see his racket face is open and he's preparing for a slice. As soon as the doll hits this, he starts to move back inside or closer to the baseline knowing that that slice isn't gonna back him up. If Federer hits a slice, Nadal isn't gonna have to give up ground and back up. So he starts moving back close to the baseline and he sees his opportunity here. Now the mistake that Nadal makes is that when he comes forward, he comes a little too close to the baseline. And we can see that when he comes this tight to the baseline on this particular ball, he's off his back foot here and his balance is off a little bit. So the likelihood that he's gonna make a mistake when he's off balance like this increases, right? As we lose our balance, it's gonna be tougher to control the ball. Let's see what he does. He goes aggressively down the line and he ends up missing the shot. Now what he should have done well, one, he shouldn't have moved as close to the baseline. He should have moved up, but not quite as far, maybe another foot back. Then he wouldn't have jammed himself and he wouldn't have missed this ball long because he wouldn't have had the poor balance position. But just kind of an interesting point to analyze, right? And to take a look at. All right, so let's jump into the third three analysis point now. And again, look at the big targets, look at a point unfold and see what we can kind of pick apart from this 3D analysis, okay? So Nadal serving, Federer receiving. Federer starts off with a backhand that lands pretty short here. Tough serve though, he had to move a lot to his left to receive this ball, right? The return lands pretty short here, but Nadal has to move over. He does give up some ground, moves diagonally back left. Hits that forehand right into Federer's backhand here. Federer does a really amazing job. This is not easy to do for most people, but he's Roger Federer, right? So he takes it super early, takes it below waist height here, and he redirects down the line. It's still slightly a big target. It lands just inside the small target area, but he hits a pretty tough shot by redirecting down the line, inside out, towards a small target area. Nadal does a really good job here 
of holding his ground on the baseline. And one of the reasons he was able to move across the baseline instead of having to back up is because Federer lacked depth here. And that, again, was a common theme for Roger. When he got aggressive on a lot of shots, he just didn't have the depth on those shots to force errors or to force really, really weak puffy balls, right? So Nadal runs over, hits the backhand, and does a good job getting pace off this when he's hunched over, does an amazing job with this. He'll be off balance, hunched over like this, and still rip balls. He has unbelievable balance in really poor positions that for most people, they can't do something like that with the ball. He gets really good pace off this. The depth isn't amazing, it's pretty good. And he forces Roger, Roger's thinking short ball, he's moving in, and he forces Roger off the back foot a little bit because of the pace of that backhand, right? Roger redirects again, goes down the line. This time he does get his depth, and we're gonna see that because he gets the depth, Nadal does really back up, having to go from one side of the court to the other. He really backs up diagonally and runs us down. Goes for that big hook forehand where he's trying to elevate and he's trying to get height. Uh, from this position, it's gonna be hard to do that, but we'll see what happens. He doesn't get the height, but he gets an amazing angle here. And this is the danger of playing Nadal from the corners of the court. Now you might say, Jason, that's really stupid to say that, but it's not. The further outside the court that Nadal is or towards the edges of the court, actually the more dangerous he becomes and the more angles that he starts to work with and play with and that you're actually giving him. And we'll get into that um, as we get into the second part of this series. But you can see that there, he hooks across. And now again, look at Nadal's body position. This guy, you know, his anticipation and his recognition of what he does to his opponent before his opponent hits the ball, is it's unbelievable what he sees before it, things actually happen. So look at his body, he's moving back in. As he sees that Federer slice, he sees this position and he's already moving back in before Federer even touches the ball. He's anticipating drop shot or you know a slice that he can move forward on. So we get a shorter slice, not quite in the third zone, it's more in the second zone that it lands there. Look at the huge move Nadal makes with his feet, diagonally back, tries to get inside the quarter close to the baseline. And he's winding up to try to do something with this backhand. Let's see if he does. Kind of a weaker ball. Thought he was gonna tee off a little bit more. A little bit weaker, floats it. Gets a little depth on it though, which is good. And maybe the intent wasn't to be super aggressive. Maybe the intent was simply to get the ball up in the strike zone, right? And we can see that by looking where Federer is receiving this backhand. So Federer is taking it closer to shoulder again. He's not trying to, but he's being forced to because Nadal rolled that ball up quite a bit. And you can see the result. Federer gets this higher, uncomfortable backhand. And let's see where that ball lands. Lands here, really short inside the court. And that allows Nadal, if he wants to tee off, let's see what he does. He loads up, hits short, and hits short cross. But again, we get another ball for Federer here. It's not the perfect contact height. It's a decent contact height. It's not shoulder height. It's a little bit lower, but it's not waist height for him here. And Federer ends up sending that backhand long. But that's a really interesting point just to look at some different things. And you can see the number of big targets there, right? Every single shot hit in that rally was a big target. And we talked about how conservative the targets were for both players in the first set and the second set. So let's move on now to the next point. And this is one where we start to get into some small targets and the big shift that happened in this match. I don't think people give Nadal enough credit for his understanding of when to kind of flip the switch and to change things in a match. In the third set, Nadal's big targets, we'll get into the stats really quick, were 61% in the first four and final shot. He went from 84% in the first two sets to 61% big targets in the third set. For Federer, that number went from 78% in the first two sets down to 71%. So he took more risk in the third set once things were kind of over, right, in a sense. And Nadal took a lot more risk in the third set. And you might say, well, why did Nadal do that? Well. How many French Open titles does he have on clay? How much confidence does he have on this surface, especially at this venue? And what's their head-to-head -head on clay, uh, especially at the French Open, right? Nadal gets up two sets to love. He's extremely confident. He knows that from this position, he can basically step on Roger at this point. So his target shrunk dramatically. And we'll kind of look at that in this point right here. But it's really interesting to see how much his strategy changed in the third versus Roger's. 
So we see Nadal start here, immediately makes a move forward closer to the baseline to receive this return, right? So he's trying to get aggressive, getting an aggressive position. Federer's inside the court off of his serve, right? Very typical. And Nadal hits a bullet forehand that lands pretty much in the third zone here and puts Federer on his back foot immediately off balance. Extremely uncomfortable position for Roger to be in right here. This is not what you're looking for, but Rafa hit a bullet on this return. Federer does a really good job to actually take this. And you'll see a lot of players do this. Very typical when you're on your back foot for a pro or any player, they're gonna hook this forehand up like this and follow through high to try to achieve depth, right? So we're hitting that reverse forehand or that hook forehand to try to achieve depth. Federer does that by hitting deep into the third zone. It could have been deeper, but his position was tough when he had to receive that ball, right? So Nadal moves over. He looks pretty comfortable when he goes to hit this shot, moves back a little bit to his right. And this is sort of one of those oops situations. I can guarantee you on this particular ball, Nadal was not trying to hit a small target. I think he actually mishit it a tiny bit but he ends up hitting a small target from this position. And one of the reasons he was able to do that though is because he received a wide ball again. When you receive wide balls in the court like Nadal's receiving here, it really opens things up for you. You can go wider here, you can go wider here. So that means Federer's gotta cover a lot of ground on the other side. So he received this ball, he ends up hitting a small target, and this target 100% damages Federer. Federer has to move uncomfortably all the way from here, he's moved 24 feet to this point already. We got the movement tracker up top. But to get to this ball, he's had to move about 18 feet to cover that forehand, right? Now, he did a good job of trying to move inside the court while he did it to take some time away. But he's definitely 100% uncomfortable having to move that far to this ball. Let's see what happens. You can also tell here by the position of Federer's hips right now, he's going to bullet this probably down the line. It doesn't look like he's going cross. The hips are a little closed off here. He's probably taking it somewhere in here is my guess. Let's see what happens. He hits a rifle shot. The problem with that shot is where it lands. So we see the depth. He's hitting that in zone two instead of zone three. We really wanna see that ball back here, especially if you're hitting to Nadal's forehand from off the court, right? Nadal runs over, has to back up because of the pace, but not the depth, hooks it back deep. And now Federer is in super scramble mode. So he's outside the court. Nadal's like, hey, I don't have to hit that great of a shot on this next shot. I can just roll this high deep and put Roger in a really bad position. Federer had to come from, again, he's moved 49 feet to this point, right? Now just to cover this next shot, he's at 72 feet. So he moved about 23 feet, you know, in a span of a second or so, but a really short period of time. He's on immediate defense and now Nadal is looking immediately from this position his first move is right back inside or trying to get close, knowing the short ball is coming. And what Nadal has here is he has a really good opportunity now because he has so much time and anticipation skills to move around and hit the forehand that he really wants. His backhand's a great shot. It's improved a lot in the last few years, but his forehand is, it's a huge weapon. So he moves around, gets all the time in the world, and from this position, Federer is essentially a sitting duck from this spot. And Nadal can take this forehand either here or here, I mean, here, here, here. He could do that if he really wants to. If he wants to take a little bit more risk and hit a little bit more of an angle, he could do that too. Let's see what he does. Hits a small target winner and the point is over. And that was a percentage play from the position he was in, right? We talked about how he could go here, how he could go here, and hitting that small target while moving forward with the forehand, huge percentage play. This happened in the third set and we saw a huge shift in the targets that occurred in the third set for Nadal versus the first two sets. That wraps it up for our 3D analysis part one for Federer versus Nadal from the 2019 French Open semifinal. So if you like this video, make sure you smash that like and subscribe button below. Also turn on your notification bell so that you can be notified when new content is uploaded to YouTube for TennisUnleashed.net. Stay tuned for part two. We're gonna break down some more stuff, including return to serve position and net play. So if you're interested in that, again, like and subscribe. We'll see you next time. I'm Jason Frosto for TennisUnleashed.net. We'll see you soon.